Friday morning, and I'd like to share all the wonderful things that happened since last presentation and what come out of your contribution. So let me start out by saying why I think design is really important. Uh, everybody's talking about, everybody knows about, you know, Apple computers and, and Google and so forth. This is a study by the Danish government of 2009 of about 1,600 companies. So these are not startups, but they are smaller companies. Typically in my country, companies are smaller. And it shows basically if you said no design to 100, and then you go out and hire design consultancy. So now this is probably not popular to say, but then your revenue is dropped by 10%. So hiring a design consultancy to help you out is a really bad idea, at least if you do business in Denmark. Of course, it's not because the designers are bad, right? Uh, it's because it's a sign that you're not really having an integrated structure. You don't, you're not really controlling your process, right? Then if you have design as part of your process, you basically get 9% over 100. So 9% you get from having integrated design in the design process. And then if you integrate design in innovation and business, you get an extra percent out of it. Doesn't that surprise you a little bit? That you can only get an extra percent out of integrating design into innovation and business. And I said, wow, that's interesting data. And then I spoke with all the smart people I know. And we concluded that this is spelled in America, it's spelled opportunities. We're just not doing well enough today. And what I've been looking at so far, the data today looks like it at least received another 30% improvement in, in those numbers if you include design in your business strategy planning as well as in uh, your innovation process. So let's see at startups. So that's what you're interested in. What's important for startups? Well, it's a study of bootstrapping, friends, friends, fools, and family, uh, angel investors. And this is when you want to, to scale and move forward with VC. So there is a study by a, a student, actually, at the Cash University in, in London. And he basically looked at 16 different uh, VC firms in Europe as well as in, in the United States. And he found out that these were the most important things for VCs. And the ones that I've outlined in orange, and you notice it, this will always be in orange. It's the, that, it's the items where design has a significant influence. So if you look at like market drivers, the, the product, and your principle, and the, the concept and getting it to work, and the commercial proof of concept, is somewhere where design has a, a large influence. So this is a good reason to include design in your process early on when you're having a style. How many here use designers in their company? Oh, so I'm... I'm Talking to the converted, yeah, great. <laughs> so this is the, the roadmap, the, the reality that I'm going to be operating with. So basically, uh, the, one of the ways we analyze opportunities, we're talking about a market risk and a technology risk matrix. So let me just quickly explain. So down here in the bottom, you know we have incremental products. You are basically already operating with a recognized need. Uh, when you take on a little bit more risk, you are you're clarifying needs. Maybe you're improving ergonomics or you're realizing a certain color smells better or you know and here you're realizing a completely new need that people didn't realize they had and, and one of my examples my favorite examples of this would be I don't even remember when the iPad came out I couldn't figure out what to use an iPad for I had a MacBook Air I had my, my iPhone why would I have something in between that didn't even have a camera right? it made no sense whatsoever and now we probably use our, our iPads more than many other things right I must have wrong ears. <laughs> I thought they were tiny. And then if you look at the other axis, you're basically operating with the current technology. So in, in the fashion industry with zippers and buttons and so forth, right? Uh, you can apply a new technology where basically you're bringing a technology from a different domain or a different type of business into your domain and leveraging it. And at the top, you're developing your own technology. And of course, as you move up the axis, the risk goes, goes really up uh, tremendously. So when you're out here at breakthrough innovation, you're looking at 95% failure rate. Uh, so uh, that's what I call it, can be catchy country. That's uh, basically suicide. Down here, you have red ocean. You're familiar with blue ocean strategy? Everybody, I'm assuming. So this is basically where you, all the sharks are. And you have down spiraling uh, profit margins. And then, then what I, I, I coined, the, the, the maverick shore, right? It's basically where you, you just gotta catch the wave just perfectly and, and then ride in and, 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 and make money. Of course, it can also be very turbulent. Uh, you know that when the automotive industry started in the US, there was 4,000 uh, companies that made cars. And now we have two and a half, or 
<laughs> so this area here is basically based on studies where you will see the highest expected return. So when I say highest expected return, it's when you multiply, you know, your projected returns with your risk along with those two axes, and of course then suddenly things look uh, less rosy. Here is my big, your guys' big contribution, so thank you very much. This is data from, as I said, Silicon Valley, as well as from uh, San Fernando Valley. So we have 61 data points. And um, what you can see here is basically uh, the companies that got, that's operating still without financing, the companies that got financed, and the ones that got acquired. And what's interesting to see is this is a really good space to be, right? So these companies here that got acquired was acquired by, as like Facebook and LinkedIn and Google, right? So they, they, they got the red Ferrari out of this, right? Um, what you can see here is that this is how much risk you're going to take on, right? So let's say you go out and realize you need out here, it, it gets really difficult. And what's happening is when you're a startup, if you're a couple of guys in a garage or in an attic, um, you don't have a lot of social capital. You don't know that many people. You're not that tapped into what's going on. So your chances of realizing a new need is very, 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 very small. Uh, if you are looking in this area where there's a recognized need, right? This is where the big competitors compete with lots of money, where you know, BMW has a billion dollars for advertising the new 7 Series, right? And those kind of budgets, you know, Marlboro or Coca-Cola, you know, startups can't really compete with that. Uh, if you look down here at the top one, developing new technology, you know, Google would be a good example of somebody who did, but typically this is a very difficult area to play because, you know, you need both financial, human, and social capital which startups typically wouldn't have. They would typically have uh, human capital. So a good area for startups, which the data always seems to indicate, is that, that human capital can help you here, and then you need to move up to apply tech here. You know why? It's basically, if you don't get up to this area here, you don't get any IP, and if you don't have any intellectual property, you're not that interesting uh, investment for, for that venture capitalist. So that's kind of how it, it, it works. Does this make sense to you? Yeah. I'm not blowing smoke up your skirt or your boxer shorts. Right? <laughs> uh, so uh, what I did was, uh, based on data uh, we collected in Korea and Seoul, on uh, student projects, so as a student project, these were students between 24 and 40 years old that worked for Kia or Hyundai or Samsung or LSD. And we looked at that project, found out predictors for how well they executed it. So if you have the market risk, the technology risk, and the execution risk, and you multiply those three together, you have a pretty good indicator of how good your business is. And uh, this is basically a very simple uh, multivariable linear regression analysis. So this is the, the formula we have. Uh, it's basically depending on, on the business philosophy, the expression, so that would be styling aesthetics or human factor interface, and then the technology risk we take on. Um, so we look here, here are a couple of our, our predictions and put them in the matrix, and they actually, they actually fit very well with what you would expect it to be in the different quadrants. So then the question of course is, should you build an, an early prediction of them? And let me tell you this way, this is not like the truth I'm telling you. It's, it's truth in progress. So you build a model, right, that seems to work on Koreans, right? And so, does it work somewhere else or does it only work on Koreans? So here you can see the Hanyang students in Seoul, and then we tried it out on students at uh, Long Beach uh, University, their design department, to see if it actually acts as a good predictor of the grades. And uh, so it's a different culture, um, it's a different type of profession, so the other guys were engineers. And you can see here that the prediction was actually really well for the Hanyang students that took lower risk than the engineers in Korea, and with a correlation of, of 8 9. So about 90 some percent of the variability can be uh, assigned to uh, being covered by this model which is pretty darn good for your, for your first job. Um, then of course, you know, how does that actually relate to reality? Can you make money with this prediction? And uh, uh, you're all familiar with Kickstarter, right? Mm -hmm. So Kickstarter is where you can pledge money, you can pre-order uh, to a, a company that uh, basically sells its pitch, and then hopefully you might actually get the product one day uh, with the mail. So here we look <coughs> at uh, uh, 35, uh, 50 companies uh, that 
got the most money on, on Kickstarter uh, and looked at where they were located in the matrix. And then we did an analysis of those based on the pitch they had online. And this is what we learned. So basically, you know, at, the, at that time, the one that got the most got like $13 million, right? And I think number two got six, and number three got $3 million. <coughs> um, so out of, you know, 11,600 uh, projects posted. And of course, you know, we can't predict the outliers, right? Outliers are those, those that come once in the blue moon. And our algorithm, you know, had no chance of, of guessing those. So, so that's not reliable. But when we look at the area between $1 million and half a million dollars pledging, so that was 35 companies at that time uh, on Kickstarter. We could basically predict that very, very well. Um, and this is how well we predicted it. We basically predicted it with a correlation of 0.46 uh, uh, out of those 33 we looked at, and it's statistically significant. So it means that about 70% of the variability of the prediction of the pledging amount can be predicted by the, by the formula. And that's pretty darn good. So it's just 30% you can't predict, but 70% you know is covered by by the, by the formula. So um, so let's say you're a Kickstarter person and you start your own project. You might want to know, you know how good your idea is before you go through the whole pitching experience. So this could help you with that. What will then help you in the second step uh, is if you look at, at web citations. So you're all familiar with web citations, right? It's when you enter banana space in the Google search window, it tells you how many websites have banana split on them, right? So that's your, your web citations. So if you look at the amount of web citations, for all these 33 projects, the correlation suddenly changed to 0.9, <coughs> which means it's like 0 0.9, 95% of the predictability. Uh, you can use a web citations for that. You can get really accurate. So if you get a lot of web citations, it also means that you're going to get a lot of pledging on your Kickstarter uh, project. So that's, of course, very helpful when you want to invest uh, three to six months uh, on, a, on a Kickstarter campaign. Is this anything that surprised you? Anything that have any of you put things on Kickstarter? That's impressive. <laughs> or Indiegogo. Or Indiegogo. I, I chose Kickstarter, uh, but it could have been any, any platform. So we have one daring person here. Good. <laughs> so let me share you with you briefly the latest thing that we are up to. So I, so this is with the Kickstarter I did over Christmas, right? So between Christmas and New Year, and, and uh, my wife was put in good enough by this. Uh, and I was basically planning on wrapping everything up and show it to you guys. And then what happened, I got contacted by the Index Award. Are you familiar with the Index Award? Yeah, you see a couple of nuts. So basically, it's the world's largest monetary design award. It's given out by annual, uh, by the Danish government. And they give out $460,000 uh, to five uh, winners in, in five different categories. And uh, they contacted me and asked me if I wanted to be a partner uh, in their project this year. So they're basically going to be announcing the winners in Denmark in, in August on the 27th. And uh, if I want to participate doing research and, and basically share experience on their the project. And I've been working with awards since 2005, so I was like, oh, yeah, great fit. But what really got me on board was they do something that, and I've talked to a lot of people, is that, and tell me if, if, if you know something I don't know, uh, they are basically combining a design award with a vetting process for venture capital financing. So they get about you know, 1,123 applicants, and they basically narrow them down to, to 50 finalists, and then five winners. And of the 50 finalists, they go out and look and see if any of those are good investment opportunities uh, for the Danish uh, investment community, which means they're going to be making money, which means they're going to be taxes, which means that Denmark is going to be a happy country. So, uh, so it's a very clever thing that I just haven't seen before. And then, of course, the question is, how good is design as an indicator of the success of a company? How helpful would it actually be in the process? So here's typically the, 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 the funneling for, for projects right? you start with. You no, know, so 1,123 guys, and 50, uh, 10 of them are selected or so. And then you know you will have typically like four. Uh, one becomes one of those famous hockey sticks we're all dreaming about, right? Mm -hmm. And the other three is more like you know, linear growth, so, so not as, as dramatic. Uh, what I did was uh, I got the uh, data from the index award on the finalists, and of course the trick is not to peak. So I didn't look at it, and then I basically went out and analyzed 200 of the uh, applicants that were on the website uh, to see you know, if I could score them as accurately as they could decide on the finalists. 
And, and the reason I had to take 200 was because statistically, you know, if I take 200, I would get 10 finals in my in my in my in my, in my, in my experiment, right? And if I take 2Q, I would risk that I wouldn't get it at all. And then I would have to start peaking, and then it would influence my, my, my study. So here you can see, I believe this is the category called uh, home, uh, where of course I have 40 in each of the five categories, making uh, 200. And here you can see this is uh, my prediction of the uh, finalists. And uh, these are the ones that actually won. So when I scored mine, I actually got very close to their finalist uh, at that prediction. What you can also see is the curve is pretty flat, right? So the difference between the finalist number 49 or 50, right, and the runner-up number 70 or 80, it's not that big. It's probably less than the accuracy of the voting process. So uh, my recommendation to them was, and that's also in the two articles I uploaded to uh, uh, our um, meeting uh, in, uh, announcement uh, from the Huffington Post, is basically that they, they, they widen their scope from just the 50 finalists, maybe to the, up to the, to the 80 or the, or the 100 ones. They seem to capture more really promising uh, companies because the, the difference is, is so small. So uh, let's look at the risk taking. So looking at the average risk taking for the applicants and the finalists, and this here is statistically significant, so it's, it's a difference that makes it different, right? So, you know, uh, applicants uh, have 58% uh, chance of success, while finalists have only 47 <coughs> And that was the market risk, right? If you look at technology risk again, the, 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 the chances of success for the applicants are higher than the, the finalists. And then when you use our uh, uh, model, we also did one for the execution risk, right? And of course, the trick is when you multiply those three together, you get an accumulated chance of success. And here you can see that the, the, the finalists and everybody else have a very different risk. 15% for the finalists and 22%. Uh, for the for everybody else that apply, so um, the finalists are more risky than, than the other people that apply, and you know that makes an awful lot of intuitive sense, right? Because for you to become a finalist, you basically have to have drawn attention to yourself, right? You have to be special and interesting and, and newsworthy and so forth, and and you wouldn't be that if you are down in the incremental area and, 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 and not really standing up, not really taking any risk. Uh, so let me show you what is the difference between. 15% uh, and 22% is out of Who cares, right? Well, and this is here for all applicants, and this is here for the finance. And this is basically a simulation where we project, you know, what would, would the revenue stream look like for a typical one of those you know, companies that start out by uh, losing money and then they go in and then they have one of those hobby stick growth, right? So we use that as a simulation example. And then basically we multiply the two types of risk. And here you can see when you multiply it by the 22, they do see a little a little revenue at the end of it, right? So you multiply the hockey stage, the erosion hockey stage with, with the risk profile. And down here we have it again for the, for the finalists. And here basically they didn't make it within the four years that we used for our you know, case study. So it can be the difference between you know, people giving up on you or people saying, oh, we might put a little bit more money in there. It, it seems to be starting to get traction, right? Um, so here is at, uh, basically the, the 200 cases we looked at. And here you can see the average for all applicants and all for the finalists. So you can see the finalists are taking on more risk, uh, combined risk than uh, all the other ones. And um, just if you wonder who was actually applying, right? So uh, was it like students from Greenland or uh, the New Zealand Islands or something? Or <laughs> that's indeed, you know. No, so uh, Tesla was one of them, right? And this one here is Tesla with their the batteries for home. And uh, I said they would be here with a three percent chance of success. And you know you have to really watch out when you predict things, right? And, and the results are in yet. But basically, they are betting on that people are going to put batteries in the house, right? And it's not really proven yet that people are going to do that. And they have a technology that's new, but you know, just like with the cars, a couple of cars, you know, catch fire in the beginning, and things happen, right? You know, that might happen with a couple of houses, and, and you might run into some problems. So, so I wouldn't call it a slam dunk. But they also had um, Google's uh, self-driving car was one of the finalists. Hmm. But also, IKEA had a system where it was like uh, expandable furniture for, for small uh, apartments in New York or so, where you could basically use it to create different devices, divisions of your room, and get more out of your space. So, so it was a lot of uh, big players, and a lot of players, you know, they wouldn't have heard about it. One of them was a, a phone scope, which basically allowed you to take one dollar uh, microscopic studies of people's blood and see if they were sick. Sorry, sir, can I? Do you know the winner in the lower left? 
<laughs> this one here, I forgot, I have said that, yeah, but I'd be happy to look into it, yeah. Uh, so, of course, it's important to have your risk profile right. You know, that, that makes sense, right? You don't take more risk than you can, than the deep depthness of your pockets, right? Uh, but another thing is also, if you look at the nine design quality criteria that we use for measuring the design quality, um, you can have a high score, right? But if your distribution on the, on the different things you're being measured on is very uneven, this means that there's a lot of risk in your, in your product anyway. So let's say this one here, you know, the process and the functionality is lower on the, on the test for something else. The environment is, is, is going to be high, right? So, so it says something about, you know, if it had been more even, it would be more likely to work because there's not one area that's more sensitive than the other one. Um, and other things that are interesting to see is the difference between the finalists and the um, applicants was um, on, on these criteria here was on innovation, environment, and viability. So those were the only three individual design quality criteria where there was a clear difference between the two categories of, of applicants and, 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 and finalists. And um, then, of course, you want to balance your risk. So this is also, again, a case of if you have perfect balance, right? 33, 33, 33, your technology, market, and execution risk are balanced. But you might have a different type of organization that's uh, stronger in one area than in another area. So uh, let's put in a Tesla here, right? So you see here, they are weaker on the market, so that, do they actually gonna put batteries in their basement, right? Uh, for $3,000, $6,000, right? Uh, but you see here, they're stronger in the technology and stronger in the execution as compared to, so you can see there's slightly uneven a balance of, of competence or, or, or risk taking. Thank you very much for your, your listening and please help me fill, by filling out your company on the, on the questionnaire that I, 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 I share with everybody. And now we open it for yeah. questions. And Thank you, Dr. Soren. Thank you. So much data in my head about this. Uh, amazing. Uh, so we're going to open up to Q&A. Raise your hand. We'll pass the mic around. Um, if you get the microphone, stand up, say your name, what company you're with. Um, let's leave this to just questions right now. Um, after the presentation, we can give commentary um, and thoughts on Tesla and their batteries. Um, let's leave that for after. So we're going to help just a few questions. Who's got a question? Recommendations? <laughs> well, I think uh, with your talk on design and startups, maybe we can start with designing a new earpiece for you. I think uh, my ears just have standard form. <laughs> it's a Viking form, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, your information, is it, um, as far as the, the mitigating some of the risks for startups and, and incorporating more design into it, um, You've got some uh, very uh, compelling information or conclusion. Um, how would you like to continue this study, and, and what more do you think you can um, get out of it by, uh, by including a larger group of... Um... <laughs> Sorry, John. So, um, so far, you know, we're going to be following the index companies and actually over time see how well they perform compared to application. So that's, that's one study. Then I'm looking at the um, LA tech uh, data that was happening yesterday, collecting data on them and following the, what those companies to see how they perform. So basically, their performance over time and see how it actually turns out. And then I'm collecting data here at Innovate, you know, Pasadena, to get data. And then we are looking for startups that we can collaborate closely with and follow them also getting some, not just quantitative, but also some qualitative data about what's going uh, well and what's not going well. And what I'd like to share with you here, and, and thank you very much for your contribution, is that uh, the study here actually got accepted for the International Design Conference in uh, Milano. So as a paper, a scientific paper, so I'm going to be presenting it at the end of July and get feedback from other smart people and then of course I'll be happy to, to report back. What we do in our organization is we start out by writing Huffington Post article about the concepts and ideas and by getting a conversation going, we then develop something that's, that works better than if it's just you know, a small group and then we from there on turn it into scientific papers and publish. So we kind of go the other way around than, than what typically researchers will be doing. Did that answer your question, John? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Does anybody have questions? <laughs> Hi, my name is Larry Alvarado. I uh, remember you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Anyway, you, you seem to imply that um, being on the cutting edge isn't necessarily the best place to be, but being innovative is. 
Uh, is that because uh, cutting edge falls off more often, or is that because people are investing in what is more or more mainstream or less edgy, and, and they support it more, or what? Why? You know, it's an interesting question. So we did some study with the Korean students. I'm assuming it probably applies to America too. So we looked at, you know, when you start developing your business and you start planning and your business model and business strategy and, and so forth, in the process you basically start to change your view of the world. You start to believe that you have more control of the world and you can predict the world better than you could when you started. And this phase of the world having changes is just your, your perception and your ability to read it. So what I think happens typically is that people think, oh, I can, you know, th this is where the money is, right? So I can realize a new need, no problem. You know, I just talk to my mother and sister and wife or girlfriend, and then I'll find a new need, no biggie. But it's, it's way harder <laughs> than, than you think it is, and the risk is, is way harder than you think it is, right? So I think that's one of the trap fields that people fall into, is that the, 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 the assets, the need to have your financial, human and social capital, it's, it's, it's just not as great as you think it is. You, you're kind of fooling yourself. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. And, but you know, in a way, you kind of have to have some of that overconfidence. Just basically because if you weren't a little overconfident, nobody would be stupid enough to start your own company. Right? I mean, it takes a, a little bit of a positive, optimistic, go-getter attitude to even be started, right? And, and all the naysayers. So you need to have that in you, but at the same time, you also kind of need to, to balance it out with you know, the fact that, you know, do remember it's somebody's Tapping you on your shoulders and remember, you know, you are over-evaluating your ability to predict and you are evaluating to actually change things. Did it help, Larry? Mm -hmm. Back here. Yeah, I have, I have a question. I apologize. I was a couple minutes late. Um, can, you, can you define what a design-driven driven startup is and then what the characteristics are? Sorry, where, where is the... Back here. Oh, yeah, I see. Oh, yeah, hi. Sorry, I didn't get back to you. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, um... So the way I define a design-driven startup is typically startup that, where design, of course, is significant for the company's success, right? And it's basically where there's a large amount of, of human factors, user interface with the product. The companies or the type of products that people typically be looking at is um, is like consumer uh, electronics, uh, automotive, medical, uh, and uh, construction equipment. So things where people engage with sports equipment and stuff like that, right? So it, I wouldn't be saying, I'm not talking about websites, I'm not talking about oil platforms, you know, or something like that, but it's things where there's a high interface between uh, the user and the product. Well, I, I, I would tend to agree that everything has, almost every startup has design associated with it, whether that's an industrial app or not, so I'm just trying to get to the heart of it. You know, I love you saying that because yeah. it's not that long ago it wasn't the case. So you guys want to hear something really brilliant. So I graduated from the Danish Technical University, right? which is one of the, the pretty darn good schools in Denmark, in Europe, right? And back when I became a mechanical engineer, nobody thought about sustainability. It's not that we were evil engineers, but you know, it was the part of the requirement. It's not people didn't think about it. You know, you know that you shouldn't pollute by pulling things into the ocean and stuff like that, but nobody thought about just optimizing products for environmental performance. That's, that's happened the last 20, 30 years. So that the design is now becoming a part of the process. Wasn't obvious back then, if you look at that, Starting from Denmark, right, the companies that basically put designing as an add-on, you know, lost a 10% of the revenues, that still happens today. Otherwise, it wouldn't be in the data, right? So design is doing much better uh, and, and much more prominent, but there's still a lot of opportunities. And back then, you know, it, it was that, what do you call it, putting lifting on a head kind of thing, right, uh, in, in many ways. Did that help you? Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Real quick question. For Southern California, for Pasadena, for Long Beach, the areas uh, that you've covered or um, what your research has, done, has covered so far, what kind of technology have you seen companies try to apply? Or what is the niche that you see Southern California seems to be pretty good at? So, um, I haven't looked at technologies per se, but I had an interesting study I just did at Stanford last week and asked in the College of Design and international uh, engineering schools here. Uh, two weeks ago when I was at Stanford. So basically, I looked at the risk that um, students took on. So it was like uh, 26 student teams, right? I looked at the amount of risk they took on. Uh, and when I looked at the, um, so the performance of, of Stanford students with students from Finland and, and Australia or you know, in France or Germany, 
you know, they were, they were basically equally good. It's not like Stanford students were like, way better, you know, had a particular golden glory or something, right? <laughs> um, but if you looked at the amount of risk that they were willing to take on, Stanford students took on 30% more risk than their peers around the world. And um, when I looked at our center students, so I, I graduated from our center as a trans guy, so those are, of course, the most conservative sketch nerds in the world, right? <laughs> and make it really beautiful and, and passionate. When I looked at a project from, from our center called Design, they took e on even less risk than the Stanford students and international students. So we might actually have a, um, a conservatism bias in Pasadena. Uh, and you know, that might be okay because it gives you competitive advantage in different spaces. But you need to be aware of it, what, what, what your limitations are. And then if you want to change them to move up towards something else, you need to find a strategy to do that deliberately. Did that answer your question, John? Yes. Hi, my name is Mike. I'm with NAI Capital Commercial Real Estate. Sorry, I got the same cough you did. Yeah, it's maddening. It's hard, yeah. Um, I think it would help if you told us of a company that we would be all familiar with that's actually made it, that has very poor design, that makes your head explode when you look at their design. So, maybe I've been living in South Africa for too long, <coughs> but I, I'm very politically correct. <laughs> I, mean, I don't like you know, basically pointing fingers at people that don't do it well. So, so I, 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 I just don't do that. You know, this is the way I've, I've been brought up and how you take back to other people. If something is not very good, you try to nurse them, help them, and support them. So, so, yeah, that's just not in my, my nature to, to point anything out. What I can tell you is that uh, I was very fortunate when I did my PhD at Stanford to get uh, 500 industrial design award applications uh, from all over the world in the product category, right? And uh, out of those 51, 50 got awards and 490 didn't get any awards, right? And uh, uh, so uh, when I looked at the companies that applied for awards, the ones that applied and didn't win it's not like it was stinky companies. These were about huge companies from all over the world that you're very familiar with. So they do good design, but the 51, the 50 you know, that actually made it to, to getting an award just did a little bit better. Right? And when I looked at the, the difference in stock value of the ones that were close but no cigar and the ones that got an award, they basically had a difference in stock valuation by 6.5% annually. So every year, the ones that were just a little bit higher, you know, basically outperform everybody else by 6.5%, and they will also outperform the S&P 500 by 5.5%. So, so there is a difference between good and bad, uh, but you know, if I started mentioning those that did poorly, I, I would kind of not be a credible research partner. So, yeah. Did that kind of help you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'll see everybody, you got your... Uh, I normally ask um, what we can do for you, but you've already passed out your flyers and given us homework, so uh, please do your homework <laughs> and give your flyers to Dr. Soren. Um, you have a question? No, thank you. What's up? Then you give them to me also. Oh, or give them to Augustine. Uh, so somebody asked me earlier um, if we can get a show of hands and we'll pass the mic around if there's enough people, but um, who here is looking to hire somebody, um, looking to actually hire a, a full-time position? Um, <laughs> In the back, can you can you yell or can we pass this around? Hi, I'm Kang <coughs> with the Cell Molecular, and we're looking for chemical engineer or chemist who has production experience in botanical extraction and purification. And don't everybody raise your hand all at once. <laughs> 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 Sorry, I'm going to start Anybody else? Hi, my name is John Chumello. I'm actually looking for writers. If anybody does copywriting, give us a contact. Either me or Augustine. Thanks. Anybody else? Alright. Thank you. So thank you everybody for coming. Uh, we will be here next week, uh, next Friday. We'll have a great presentation for you. Um, Soren will be available after the, um, right now to chat. And please um, spend some time networking and getting to know one another. We'll see you next week. <laughs>